All right, good morning. Open your Bibles to that passage, please, to John chapter 12, beginning at verse 27. That's going to be our text this morning, John 12, 27 through 50. The topic we find there, Jesus was lifted up on the cross to draw all men to himself. The title of our message, The Lift That Keeps On Lifting. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the Gospel of John. Thank you for the, the life of the Apostle John. We appreciate, Lord, the work of the Holy Spirit in his heart, uh, inspiring the writing of this book and uh, for you preserving it, Lord, up until this time so that we can hear living words, true words, words that bring life and, and light and vitality, not just to our lives, Lord, but to our church and to the world around us. I pray that we would hear everything that you have to say to us today, that we would hear what the Spirit has to say to us individually and to the church corporately. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name, and those who agreed said, amen. I'm okay right up until the technician asks, have you ever had metal shavings in your eyes? Metal shavings can get in your eyes without you knowing it. As a teen, I worked summers with my dad and brothers at the auto shop. Safety equipment like eye protection was not provided by management. What management did supply was a plenty of ridicule if you wanted to stay safe. Those were the days. My dad's attitude towards safety measures in general was encapsulated in this bit of wisdom. Seat belts kill more people than they save. That was kind of his attitude. How many of you rode in the back of pickup trucks and all of that kind of stuff? And you think, yeah, that, yeah we survived. Yeah, you don't see the people who didn't. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no safety there. Now, you're asked about metal shavings prior to a magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. One technician explains the risk with metal in the MRI is that it can heat up and cause burns or can migrate or move around. Depending on where it is, we don't want it to migrate and affect an important structure. You know, I've had MRIs a couple of times that I, once they implant the thought that you might have metal shavings in your eyes, then you just, you start to feel it. Is my eye getting a little hotter? Do I feel something? I don't want it to migrate out. In 2001, a six-year-old boy died at a New York area hospital when the machine's powerful magnetic field jerked a metal oxygen tank across the room, hitting him. MRIs are also a huge problem if you're hosting an alien symbiote. Eddie Brock found that out the hard way in the movie Venom. The cross of Jesus Christ is the world's most powerful magnet, if you'll allow us to use that as an illustration. Jesus would be lifted up, crucified on the cross at Golgotha, the place of the skull. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. Augustine said, those who belong to Jesus Christ are fastened with him to the cross. All are drawn by its power. Those who believe him are fastened there with him, saved forever. I'll organize my comments around two prayers. Number one, Jesus draw me closer. And number two, Jesus, draw me bolder. Jesus, draw me closer, verses 27 through 36. There are some voices that are instantly recognized. Christopher Walken, James Earl Jones, Morgan Freeman, Leonard Nimoy, Anthony Hopkins, William Shatner, Samuel L. Jackson, Sam Elliott, Chris Rock, Maggie Smith, Joan Cusack, Betty White, Fran Drescher, Holly Hunter, Cher, Julie Andrews, Candace Bergen. A voice from heaven is heard as Jesus makes his final public statements. Verse 27, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. This is the second time Jesus prayed aloud to God the Father for the sake of the crowd. The first time was outside the tomb of Lazarus just before Jesus recalled him from Hades. The Lord gave the people a peek into the unseen realm. They may not have understood what was said. Some thought it was thunderous, some an angel but it was clear to them that this was a stamp of approval upon Jesus. It would inspire confidence that God was orchestrating the events that would shortly be unfolding 
namely Jesus' crucifixion. As much as possible, God was trying to set them up for the understanding that what was going to happen wasn't a failure, it was the mission. Uh, how much they understood uh, is hard to know, but at least the Lord is trying to give them some encouragement that everything is going according to plan. Of course the Lord's soul was troubled. Crucifixion was awful, and his would be the worst ever. His human body would be so stressed leading to the crucifixion that he would sweat blood. No one would stay up to pray with him. Prior to his crucifixion, he would undergo illegal treatment by those who claimed to be keeping his laws. One disciple would betray him. Another would deny him. He would be severely beaten before being crucified. The people for whom he was dying, for whom he would remain forever, the God-man, mocked him. And on the cross, Jesus would be surrounded by fierce supernatural foes in the unseen realm. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came into this hour. Thirty years of obscurity, three and a half years of Messiah ministry, now it was carpe hora. Jesus would seize the hour, fulfilling the task that he had been born to accomplish. There's a cute scene in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Scotty talks to a computer, then to its mouse. He forgets that they were in the past, and computers don't talk or didn't talk at the time. It's critical to our spiritual well-being we realize the hour in which we live as servants of the Lord. We don't want to be behave, rather, as if we lived in some past or future era. A proper respect for our place in biblical history is essential. This is the church age. It's characterized by suffering for the sake of Jesus. We are to consider it joy when trials come. In the world, when we will have tribulation with a little t, we are to be of good cheer. We most gladly boast in our infirmities, infirmities rather, that the power of Christ may rest upon us. We take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for the Lord's sake. For when we are weak, then we are strong. Arthur W. Pink wrote, Though poor in this world's goods, though grieving the loss of loved ones, though suffering pain of body, though harassed by sin and Satan, though hated and persecuted by worldlings, whatever the case may be in the lot of the Christian, it is both his privilege and duty to rejoice in the Lord. We are equipped for the purpose of showing how a Christian glorifies the Lord in suffering. We're to speak as the oracles of God. Our speech is to be seasoned with grace. We're to cultivate a relationship with Jesus so that the Holy Spirit can bring forth fruit rather than our flesh. We are to love our enemies, do good to those who mistreat us. We're to be fools for Christ's sake so that the foolishness of God is shown to be greater than the wisdom of man. Those are the things that speak to us during the time in which we live. These are not Old Testament times, nor are we in the great tribulation, nor are we in the kingdom on earth. We are the church. We have our very own age with its very own parameters. Jesus tells us what he will not pray for. He will not pray that his trial be taken away. He knew exactly where he was on the timeline. Now, of course, you look at Jesus and you think, yeah, this is a pretty important ministry. Going to the cross, this is a make it or break it kind of thing. And so we can see that. We rarely think that way of our own lives. And obviously the decisions we face aren't cosmic in that sense. But at the same time, you know, if God has put us in a particular situation, we need to be like Jesus and say, hey, for this purpose, I'm here. And Lord, if this is where you want me, and this is how you want it to be, then I'm going to uh, avail myself of your resources and, and live uh, the way I ought to live in this time. Verse 31, now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. The devil became the ruler of this world when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. We see the programs of his malevolent administration in every corner of the globe. Jesus defeated him on the cross. His power over people by sin and death was defeated, and they can now be delivered out of his domain, domain rather of spiritual darkness and the slavery to sin. It comes as a shock, usually, to realize that Satan still has access to heaven. 
We see and hear him in the book of Job practicing his despicable talent as the accuser of the brethren. He hasn't been cast out, not yet. We read in the Revelation, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And so this is a future event, the final casting down of Satan to the world, uh, or to the earth rather, so he has no longer any access to heaven. Happens in the middle of the tribulation. Uh, we studied it in the book of the Revelation. Uh, and, and so uh, it just, it's a, it's, Satan in heaven is just crazy, right? And yet the Lord is not intimidated. There isn't a, it's not a yin-yang, good, evil kind of thing. It's just God, he's God. There is no God before him, and he is uh, able to keep Satan under control. Verse 32, And then I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The best commentary on Jesus lifted up from the earth is found in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. It captures both the physical and the spiritual. Paul says, and being found in presence as a man, in appearance rather as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And so Jesus was lifted up on the cross and then he was lifted up to his exalted position and seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus promised to draw all to himself. It means all people without distinction between Jews and Gentiles, all races, we would say, even though there's one race, the human race. It means people from all walks of life, status, and stature. No one is excluded. Where Christians disagree is whether all means everyone or a smaller predestined and selected number of people. It means everyone. It means whosoever will believe. To say Jesus draws everyone is not to say everyone will be saved. It is to say that the cross and Jesus' subsequent exaltation exert a spiritual effect on every person, not just a few. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. When it is presented, it is accompanied by a drawing power. A decision to receive or reject can be made. Since this is the free will God gave us, it cannot contradict or in any way minimize his sovereignty. A lot of people want to argue about free will and the sovereignty of God and how if you allow for any free will, you put man in charge of salvation and all of this. But it, it, if you take a step back and think, wait a minute, if God created and gave us free will, then that is within his sovereignty and so is this whole transaction. And, and so we don't, we don't need to worry about that. God's not worried about his sovereignty. He's not worried about our free will. Uh, and so don't let that get you off track. Because the alternative is you, you don't have free will and God can only uh, force you or instead of draw you, he has to drag you. And so the gospel is accompanied by a drawing power. Limiting the power of the cross to draw only a few is a theological construct, not a biblical one. The Bible doesn't actually teach that. It never teaches that. Uh, the, the gospel is only for a few. But the conclusion you come to is that it is if you follow this certain way of thinking. So why do some believe while others do not believe? God only knows. And that's not a cop-out. It doesn't ignore what the Bible teaches. The Bible is consistent in saying that we are to believe and be saved. It involves a measure of free will on our part. And, and so trying to figure out exactly what happens and, and saying, I know why and how and, you know, everything that happens in the human heart as far as salvation, uh, it, it, that it leads you to these terrible conclusions. Uh, if, if God predestines some to salvation, then he predestines more to condemnation. And they have no opportunity to ever be saved. And so we want to say that this is a, a sincere offer to whosoever will. Verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever, and how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? 
Christ means anointed. It's a title of the conquering Messiah. Son of man is a title for the Messiah from Daniel chapter 7. It emphasizes the humanity and the humility of the Messiah. Today, with the completed Bible in our hands and innumerable study helps, we are still confused about certain aspects of Bible prophecy, are we not? We don't have a, a complete handle on it. No one does. Let's cut these guys some slack. They, they were having a hard time understanding the difference between who, who is the anointed one, the Messiah, and then how does the Son of Man fit in? And, and uh, at least they were asking the right questions. Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed, and he was hidden from them. Three and a half years prior, Jesus had come into the darkness of this world as its light. God the Father spoke from heaven, validating him. Jesus' ministry now was coming to an end. As if to say the Lord's work had come full circle, the Father again spoke from heaven, and Jesus reminded them that he was the light of the world. The Jews had a decision to make. Jesus had brought them to the point of decision. Now, obviously, throughout his entire ministry, he was bringing people to the point of decision, uh, preaching repentance and asking them to come to faith in him. But this is the, it's winding down now, and he's saying, hey, Messiah or no Messiah? That's the question. Jesus drew you to the cross if you're a Christian. You received him. You were fastened to the cross with him. That's a one-time experience. You're crucified with Christ. As Chicago sang, it's only the beginning, only just the start. You keep on drawing closer to him as you cooperate with his work in you. If you stalled or when you stall and you're not making much progress in your walk, Jesus, draw me closer ought to be your next prayer. It's, it's simple but profound. Uh, you know, you can't get any closer than fastened with him to the cross, but that's not the end of your Christian walk. That's just the beginning. It's the beginning of the walk with the Lord where you get to know him and uh, he reveals himself to you and you grow and find out what your life is all about. And so uh, ask the Lord to draw you closer. And even if you're not stalled or backslidden or whatever you might say, this is just a great prayer, a great attitude. Jesus, draw me close, closer now to you. Jesus, draw me bolder, verses 37 through 50. Can you be a believer if you did not openly confess Jesus for fear of man? Hold off. An answer is coming in a few verses, or at least a discussion is. So verse 37, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Signs are great but they don't always lead to a positive spiritual result. Often as not, signs harden hearts against the Lord. I don't suggest that because we are against the continuation of signs and wonders. We are not what they call cessationists. A cessationist is a, a person, a Christian, who believes that most of the miraculous gifts and the gifts of prophecy and uh, speaking gifts and things like that have ceased now that we have the Bible. No need for them. We, we are not cessationists. We believe that all the gifts are operating in the church or operational as long as they're exercised properly. It just happens to be true that signs can have an effect that you're not expecting. Just a chapter earlier here, the greatest sign that Jesus had done, according to some, raising Lazarus from the dead, had the effect of the religious leaders wanting to put both he and Lazarus to death. And so uh, that's what happens. Signs uh, sometimes confirm what's already in the heart. It isn't for lack of miracles that folks remain unbelievers. Every few years uh, or so, a wave uh, comes through the church where there's some teaching that essentially is if there were more signs and wonders following the preaching of the word, then more people would get saved. Uh, and... Um, I don't have any problem with signs and wonders as long as they're from the Lord and they're genuine. I think you can tell, you have enough discernment to tell that sometimes the signs and wonders that you hear about or see are not really biblical. They're not really special. They're not really miracles. They're, 
they're halfway healings or, or something. Or they're people who've gone into remission, not that have been totally healed. And so it, it makes us sound like we're against these things. We're not. We're just for them being genuine. It's not for lack of miracles that folks remain unbelievers. Verse 38, that the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because of Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. And these things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. They would not believe, they could not believe, they should not believe. At first reading, it sounds as though God was the cause of their unbelief. Of course not. There was plenty of evidence Jesus was their Messiah. Every indication is that they saw the evidence and the vast majority chose unbelief. I've quoted several times, but it's a, such an important passage where uh, even John the Baptist doubted or not, he wanted to make sure that Jesus really was the Messiah. And so his, he sent his disciples to talk to the Lord and the Lord didn't say yes or no. He said, tell John the signs you see. And, you know, basically he was saying, hey, I am doing everything that the Messiah is supposed to do, is going to do. Uh, and so, yeah, I am that guy. And, and it, was, it was something that was able to be seen. It was able to be understood at the beginning. God is not going to hold you responsible for something you can't do. He's not going to punish human beings for their belief if they can't believe. Right? I mean, how is that? I love uh, the Richard Nixon quote, if the president does it, it's not against the law. And that, that's so great. I, it just, it's so profound, really, when you think about it. But some people postulate a God where they say, if God does it, it's not evil. And so if, if your theory is that God saves some by his irresistible grace, but he overlooks the vast majority of human beings, and they have no hope of salvation, they cannot decide to be saved, they have no free will, they're only created to be passed over and thrown into hell, then you're saying, if God does it, it's glorious. If you did it, you'd be a serial killer. And so how can God be less moral than you? It's, it's ridiculous. It doesn't, it, it doesn't solve anything to just say, oh, the glory of God. No one deserves to go to heaven, so if, if the Lord saves even one person, it's glorious. I don't think that's really an, an argument. It's an argument that it's okay for God to be a monster. Our God's a monster, but man, he's really good to a few of us. I mean, just, I don't understand being reeled in under those auspices. Only after they chose unbelief did God blind them. There are many reasons a person will not believe. Belief in Jesus can be costly. Not always in dollars or Bitcoin, but in relationships, career activities. Can you say, rich young ruler? Not just all of his money, but all of his lifestyle and everything that he had going for him. Jesus said, hey, in your case, you're going to have to give up all of your wealth and follow me. And it was too costly. He counted the cost and it was too much for him. There are lots of reasons why a person would not believe. Sometimes it, it has to do with you know, their relationships with someone. They don't want to believe because then it would change uh, uh, you know, something that they have going on, maybe a, a believer-unbeliever marriage kind of situation. So uh, there's lots of reasons. But only after they chose unbelief did God blind them. Those who will not believe eventually cannot believe. God blinds their eyes and hardens their hearts, confirming their own choice. There is what we might call end-stage unbelief. A man may so harden himself as to render his condition irremediable, I'm quick to point out that we don't know who is in end-stage unbelief. It, we, it's impossible for us to know. Even if somebody in your face is telling you, you know, that they don't believe the Lord, I mean, we believe them, but who knows what's going on in the heart? People lie all the time. They lie to themselves, and if they lie to themselves, they lie to others. We want to deal with the won't believers as having the capacity still to respond to the draw of the cross. And so our 
responsibility, if you want to put it that way, is to just present the gospel. It has its own power to reach into hearts and reveal Jesus on the cross. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, verse 42, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Many of them did believe. Commentators mostly rip into these guys, declaring them unbelievers, and so they are believing unbelievers somehow. Better to see them as fearful, but a remnant nonetheless. Sure, they could have been bolder, and some would be by the end, such as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Being put out of the synagogue was more than you no longer attended Saturday church. You were cut off from everything you had ever known in your entire life, all family, all friendship, all fellowship, all the religion. I mean, you were just, you were excommunicated. You were gone as far as that society was concerned. And so this was a big, big problem. Now, I'm not saying we justify silence on account of fear. But there have always been difficult situations for Christians. And we need to try to extend grace as far as we can. We don't have any problem with the underground church, do we? China or some of these places where it's illegal to be a Christian. Do we want all the Christians to announce themselves and go to jail? Or do we think it's okay that they kind of fly under the radar? I think most of us would say, no, there's a place for the underground church. And, uh, you know, we, we pray for them and ask that the Lord would strengthen them and all that. Uh, and, and so there's just there's certain things Christians face that... They, they just need to make a decision about it. And uh, we don't face some of these super severe situations that they did. Uh, we may before the, you know, the rapture comes. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, uh, yeah, I mean, if, you're, if, if the question is, should you confess Christ? The answer is, yeah. Is it weird if you don't? Yeah. At the same time, what's the real situation? What's going on? Is it just that you're afraid of your earthly family? Or are you going to be beheaded? And, and all of us are somewhere on that scale, uh, more on the gentle scale than anywhere else. And so just be gracious uh, and, and encourage folks to walk with the Lord. The last set of verses function as a summary statement, a conclusion to Jesus' 33 and one half year mission to humbly go where the God-man had never gone before. Verse 44, then Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me believes not in me, but him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, not three, consisting in three persons. No one can see God the Father. He is a spirit. We can see Jesus Christ, his Son. Jesus is such a perfect reflection of God the Father in all his glory and wisdom and holiness. To look upon Jesus Christ is as if you were looking at God the Father. Verse 46, I have come as light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Pick up a paving stone and umpteen bugs scurry. Have they been there undisturbed for decades? Well, they don't seem to, you know, you don't see any activity. And then all of a sudden, you know, you pick, and it's like, how, how long have they been under there? It's crazy. People abide in the darkness of this world until belief in Jesus turns on the light. We can do a lot of good in other forums, but the permanent solution to darkness is light. And the light is the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And so we must have our, as our priority the gospel and sharing the gospel. We uh, remove that which is causing darkness so that they can see the light. Verse 47, and if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I don't judge them. For I did not come into the world to judge it, but to save it. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now, Jesus means here that he didn't come in his first coming to judge. He came to solve the problem of sin and Satan and death. Uh, and in this dispensation, during the church age, uh, the word is what judges individuals. As we preach the word, they are convicted of sin and of righteousness and of the judgment to come. He will judge in the future. At the end of the Great Tribulation, when he returns in his second coming, we read about Jesus separating the sheep and the goats. 
These are believers and unbelievers, respectively, who survived the seven years. His judgment sends the goats away to Hades while inviting the sheep into the kingdom of God on earth. It's Jesus who is the judge at the great white throne. It's described in the 20th chapter of the Revelation. All the wicked dead from all time are judged to fall short of the glory of God. They cannot enter heaven. Jesus passes judgment on them, and they are confined to eternal conscious punishment in the lake of fire. Remember, this is the church age, and so long as we are here, there is hope for unbelievers. Jesus has judged and defeated sin, Satan, and death, so that all who are drawn to him, who believe, will be saved. For I have not spoken on my own, verse 49, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say and what I should speak. We happen to have a president who frequently misspeaks. The other day he said he had cancer. The White House had to issue a correction. Now I can see how you, that's a minor mistake. The Babylon Bee this morning, they, they did a meme that said, said <laughs> one day after Joe Biden is miraculously cured of cancer, he has COVID, you know, or cancer, he has COVID. But uh, anyway, no corrections from heaven regarding the words and works of Jesus. Verse 50, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. There's a lot of so-called inspirational literature. Readers claim their favorite inspirational book changed their lives. Maybe. It did not offer them eternal life, I'll tell you that. There's no other book that offers you genuine eternal life from the throne of God. And so you can be inspired uh, in a lot of different ways, but you can only be transformed and saved uh, with the word of God. Jonathan Edwards wrote, true boldness for Christ transcends all. It is indifferent to the displeasure of either friends or foes. Boldness enables Christians to forsake all rather than Christ and to prefer to offend all rather than to offend him. Jesus, draw me bolder, bolder to listen to the God who saves and to the spirit within you following his leading and then represent where he has planted you.